So as we continue uh, in the Proverbs, uh, we're going we're gonna to be uh, looking at a few different Proverbs this morning, and that's going to kind of be our pattern throughout the series. We're, we're looking uh, kind of according to theme. Uh, we're going to begin, though, in Proverbs 4. And so if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Proverbs 4, uh, we'll pick up there here in just, just a little bit. Um, but first, I want you to consider this phrase that uh, I'm sure we've all heard this phrase. Maybe you've even uttered this phrase before, and that is, follow your heart. Raise your hand if you've heard that phrase before, maybe even said it. Follow your heart. It's in movies, it's in songs, uh, it's, it's kind of just a part of our culture. In fact, I did a, a Google search uh, just the other day, and very quickly I found an article titled, Why You Should Follow Your Heart. And just let me read to you the, the opening paragraph of this article. It says, It's never too late to follow your heart and start something you've always wanted to do. It doesn't matter what you think is holding you back. Let's just call them what they are. Excuses. It shouldn't matter if other people are doing it already or if nobody is doing it. The only question that matters is whether or not doing it would make you happy. Do not follow your heart and live. Uh, do you follow your heart and live the life that you want? Everyone has a different personality and is drawn to different things. And the more you allow yourself to pursue those things and follow your heart, the happier your life will be. Okay, so there are some true things in what I just read. There's some truth mixed in there. And you know, the last thing that I want to be is a dream crusher, right? So. Part of the truth in there is that, yeah, like, if, if, if you've got a passion, and as long as that passion glorifies God, all right, that, that's, that's a, a pretty good caveat there, then, then, then do it, right? Go and pursue it, right? Like, it, it's, it's good to have that motivation, and, and like I said, there's, there's some truth in there. I don't want to be a dream crusher, but there are indeed some very problematic things in those couple of paragraphs that I just read. You know, for example, the only question that matters is whether or not doing it would make you happy. <laughs> well, that's a big, that's a big uh, red flag, right? Because, um, well, that can be quite disastrous if you just only do what makes you happy, if that's the only thing that matters. Of course, there are other considerations that we must make. We, we cannot just follow our hearts, but we're certainly not follow our hearts blindly. And so, generally speaking... I'm going to say that this advice to follow your heart is really not good advice. First of all, uh, kind of what I just said, because it can be very disastrous if we just take it at face value, right? What a lot of people mean when they say follow your heart is, well, just do whatever feels right or do whatever makes you happy. Um, but there are lots of things that might make us happy that's uh, not for the good of others, not for the glory of God. And ultimately, not even for our good. So, it can be very disastrous. There's all kinds of other considerations we must make. But secondly, another reason why, generally speaking, it's not good advice to follow your heart is, well, Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It can be very, very dangerous to simply follow heart. So again, there's, there was some truth mixed into what I read there. Uh, uh, there can be instances in which it's good for us to follow our deepest longings and affections. We sh certainly shouldn't ignore our hearts, but we must not follow blindly. Instead, wisdom requires us to both guard our heart and to examine our heart. And then only then can we actually be wise in our decisions. The title of the sermon this morning is Knowing the Heart. And uh, as I said, we'll be looking at a handful of scriptures. And so, you know, this is the time where normally we would stand and read our main passage. We don't really have a main passage, but we have uh, a handful of problems we'll be looking at. Uh, but let me go ahead and pray for us and then we'll uh, continue on into our main points, okay? God, uh, we... Pray that as we now look to your word, as we seek to understand uh, the wisdom of the Proverbs regarding our hearts, regarding these 
deep longings and affections. Lord, help us to um, just come to a greater understanding of, of uh, how we ought to engage with our own hearts, how we can guard our hearts, how we can examine our hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the first point this morning is guard your heart. All right, this is uh, some wisdom that we get from the Proverbs. Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. Proverbs chapter 4, beginning in verse 23, says this. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from, uh, from you crooked speech, and put devious talk far from you, lest your eyes look directly forward, Sorry, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Okay, so in that very first verse, in verse 23, we have uh, this command, keep your heart with all vigilance. Or some translations will say, guard your heart. To guard your heart. Now, um, this is a common phrase, just like follow your heart. It's a common phrase that we've probably all heard. We've all heard the phrase guard your heart. But normally when people say guard your heart, they might mean something like, you know, hey, make sure that you don't get hurt. Make sure your heart doesn't end up getting broken, right? Like if you're maybe entering into some kind of romantic relationship, hey, guard your heart. You don't want to get hurt, right? That's often what people mean, but that's not what is meant here in this proverb when it says keep your heart or guard your heart. Uh, if we look at the context, we see that um, it, it means that we, we've got to be careful about what we say, what we gaze upon, uh, by walking the straight and narrow, not turning to the right or to the left, keeping away from evil. Right As we read along in the proverb, we see all the ways that we can guard our heart. Ways that we can protect our heart. Not from heartbreak. I mean, maybe that's something that would come. But, uh, but most importantly, from evil. right? To guard our heart from sin. To guard our heart from maybe the influences of the world, the flesh, and the devil. We've got to be vigilant. This is vital. Um, it's vital for us to remember that all of these things... Right, what we, again, what we gaze upon, um, what we, uh, what we listen to, what we engage with, and so on. These things have a direct impact on our heart. That is the very core of our being, our deepest longings and affections. And so, in this proverb, when it says "guard your heart," it's saying, "Hey, be careful about your conversations." Be careful as you're mindlessly scrolling on your phone. Be careful what you read, what you watch, uh, the music, the podcasts you listen to, and so on, right? These are ways that we guard our heart by not just letting anything and everything come in. Because, again, these things will have some impact, a direct impact on us. I think we must understand that, that nothing is neutral. Sometimes we might think, oh, you know, I'm just passing time, or, uh, or this isn't a big deal. But the fact is, every, everything that we take in, everything that we engage with in, in our day-to-day -day lives is really kind of putting us on one path or another, right? The path of wisdom, the path towards Christ-likeness, the, the, the path that's going to be for God's glory and for our good on one hand, or maybe it's putting us on the path of of, of foolishness and of selfishness and, and a path that ultimately is not going to be for God's glory or for our good or for the good of others, right? And so, and so, so everything is kind of pointing us one way or the other. I think it's so important that we recognize that there's, there's, not, there's not any neutral ground here. Right? Everything is subtly or sometimes quite drastically affecting our heart. And so that's why we have this command this proverb to to keep our heart to guard our heart with all vigilance 
And then notice again, look at verse 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring, the springs of life. From it flows the springs of life. Well, that is if you guard it. But if you don't guard it, well, it might be more like sewage, right? In fact, do you remember what Jesus says? He says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, of course, one reason why we ought to guard our hearts, we guard what comes in, we guard all these things, is because sooner or later it's going to affect what comes out, right? It's going to affect our speech, for example. Um... Another translation I found in this proverb, uh, maybe a little bit of a looser one, is this. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Which that sounds a lot like what Jesus said, right? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everything you do, everything you say, is going to be flowing from the heart. And so sooner or later, your true colors will show through. Everybody know what a Freudian slip is? Kids, I'll, te I'll teach you. This is a fancy word, okay? A Freudian slip. So it's named after this psychologist from way back in the day. But, but a Freudian slip is, have you ever said something by accident? I mean, this might be kind of similar to what we were just talking about a moment ago. Um, maybe you say something, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I just said that. I shouldn't have said that. And maybe you think, okay, I didn't mean to say that. But sometimes it just comes out, right? That's not just with kids. That's with adults too, right? Sometimes something just comes out. And we think, oh, that just came out of nowhere. But no, it didn't come out of nowhere. It came from the depths of your heart, sometimes even maybe even parts of your heart that you don't know about. And so it doesn't just come out of nowhere. So, sooner or later, those deeper, darker parts of our hearts will be exposed in one way or another. But it's not always immediate. It's not always immediate because, of course, the world is full of hypocrites, and Scripture talks about this as well, right? Uh, Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, where they actually are able to keep some kind of outward appearance of being all nice and pretty on the outside, but inside is a rotting corpse. Whitewashed tombs. So, so, so we, we, can, we can put on a front. We can fool others. Sometimes we can even fool ourselves. Sooner or later, it's going to come out to some extent, in one way or another. But again, it's not, it's not always immediate. And so um, this kind of leads to the next point. The next point is that we need to examine our heart. Exam examine your heart. Because um, even if you can fool others, even if you can fool yourselves, the fact is we're all sinners and we have things in our hearts that we don't know about that we need to know about. And so, you remember the verse I quoted earlier from Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our hearts deceive us, right? We cannot even understand our own hearts, but we ought to try as best we can. And I'll get into this here in a moment, but of course we need the Lord's help with that. Well, in fact, that's why David prayed in Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, so this is the same psalm that I read from in our call to worship. And so I just read the very last verses of the psalm where he's pleading with God, search me. And, and, and in a sense, he's, he's saying, hey, uh, I want you to reveal to me uh, things in my heart that I don't even know about. And I want you to lead me into the way everlasting. Because we know that God does, in fact, know every thought, ev everything we do, even before we do it. I mean, we see that at the beginning of the psalm. So, for example... Psalm 139, verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. God knows us better than we know ourselves. So I've labeled the second point, examine your heart. 
And uh, that is indeed what Scripture calls us to do, right? Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith, right? The Apostle Paul tells us that this is important even for Christians to say, hey, I need to look deep inside and make sure that I'm actually living in repentance and faith. Am I even really a Christian? Have you asked yourself that before? I, I mean, that, you know, we, we can go too far in being too skeptical of ourselves, maybe. Right? We have a security in Christ that is unshakable, and yet at the same time, we're told to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Don't be presumptuous. Don't just assume, oh yeah, I walked an aisle whenever I was you know, 12 years old or whatever, I said a prayer. Right? We, ought to, we ought to constantly be looking deep inside and examining ourselves. The kind of self-reflection is so very important. It's commanded by Scripture. And so yes, we ought to examine our hearts but one thing that I'm really kind of leaning into here is that we can't do that on our own. That we need, the, we need the Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to search us, right? Again, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, who can understand it? Right? We cannot understand it on our own. We need the Lord's help. And so we ought to pray and rely upon the Lord as we do this work of examination. Perhaps you have someone in your life that seems to know you better than you know yourself. Uh, so oftentimes that's a spouse, right? And, and, and so maybe, or maybe you said to your spouse, yeah, I know you better than you know yourself, right? And you can maybe predict things that they're going to say or do or, or, or ways they're going to react to something. And so there's, there's some truth to that in how even another person might, in some respects, know someone better than they know themselves. But that only goes so far, right? Um, of course, only you know your innermost thoughts, your deepest feelings, your secret deeds. Well, as far as mere mortals go, yes. But God knows all these things and more. Have you ever not been sure of why you do what you do? So again, kids, remember, here we were just talking about, you, you do something, you do something really, really mean. And then your parent asks you, why did you do that? Understand, kids, that happens to us as adults as well. Sometimes, you know, we might have that Freudian slip. We say something, I can't believe I said that. Or I can't believe I treated that person that way. Why did I do that? Why do we do the things that we do? Sometimes we will give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Um, and maybe too quickly, right? Now, of course, in some cases, maybe, may, maybe our motives aren't so tainted. I think our motives are always tainted by sin in one way. We're never perfect in anything that we do. Um, but oftentimes it's tainted uh, far more than we realize. So our proverb for this point is Proverbs 16.2, which says this. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Or some translations there say the Lord weighs our motives. So all, all of the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, right? Naturally, we think, okay, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this or I'm saying this for good reason. This is what needs to be said. And, and, and I don't have any kind of selfish motives here. I'm just, you know, but the Lord weighs the heart. The Lord weighs the spirit. The Lord weighs the motives. The Lord knows. And uh, we ought to do our very best to know as well. And so we ought to pray like David did. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, the fact that God knows us better than we know ourselves can be the most frightening thing in the world or the most comforting thing in the world. It may be frightening for those who are bent on living in sin and don't have Jesus as their Savior because, you know, the fact is, well, if you have any self-awareness at all, you know that you're a sinner. You know that you've done and said things that you shouldn't do or say. 
But to know that there's even a greater depth to that sin that only God knows, well, that can be a frightening thing if, if, if you are bent on living in that sin, if you're not receiving Jesus as your Savior. Because, after all, He is the just and holy judge of the universe. And if He knows every little thing about you, that is frightening if it stops there, right? But the fact that God knows everything about us, it can also be the most comforting thing in the world. That is, for those who will receive the love and forgiveness of Christ, just to think, he knows more of my junk than I do, and yet he loves me and offers forgiveness through the cross. Like, I mean, you've probably heard people say in, in, the, in the movies or maybe in real life, maybe you've said it before, oh, if you, if you only knew such and such about me, you know, you, you wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. Right? Maybe someone, you know, think like romantic comedy. Somebody has a shady past and they say, oh, if you only knew, if you only knew this about me. Well, I guess it's not much of a comedy, but. <laughs> but if, if the fact is God knows everything about us, our deepest, darkest secrets the deep, dark crevices of our heart that we don't even know about. And yet, he loves us. And he's willing to offer forgiveness. We must receive it. Right? We, must, we must turn in repentance towards Christ and say, I surrender to you. I receive your love. And forgiveness. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We also must remember that God offers more than just forgiveness of our sin. You hear me say this often. Um, the gospel is not merely that God came to, that Jesus came to forgive us of our sins, but he offers freedom from our sins. The Bible talks about us being conformed into the image of Christ. That uh, as, as believers, we are to be, we're becoming more and more like Jesus day by day. That's a work of the Spirit within us, but of course it's something we participate in, right? We must pursue that. There's a freedom that comes through the gospel. But one way we receive that freedom is through, sometimes, sometimes it's painful, but it's for God to reveal to us the sin within us and to convict us of sin. That's one reason why we do the, the prayer of confession every Sunday. First of all, Scripture tells us to confess our sins to the Lord. But, but it also, it, it requires us to like stop and think for a moment about, okay, what are, what are ways that I have sinned against God? What are certain attitudes in my heart that are sinful? It's not just about the things that we do. It's not just about our actions, but it's also about our attitudes, right? And then to even ask, you know, in that time of confession or day by day as we confess to the Lord, we can, again, pray, Lord, search me and know me and ask God to reveal to us sin that we don't even know about. And there's, there's a few benefits of that. One is that you're going to be much more graceful grateful for the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Because if you think that Jesus came to die just for, you know, oh yeah, I told him a lie a couple days ago and I did this and that. If that's all it is, then yeah, yeah, it's nice to be forgiven, but you know, no, not a huge deal. But if you understand the deepest, darkest corners of your heart, then you're going to be all the more grateful for the grace that comes through Jesus. But then not only that, again, it's not, it's not only the forgiveness that comes, but it's the freedom from that sin, which, which God works this in, in many different ways. And again, one way is as he reveals those things to us, as we examine our hearts and ask the Lord to help us, that helps us to actually gain freedom from those sins because, well, you can't be free from them if you don't even know about them, right? You can't turn away from them if you don't know they're there. And so, and so there's this heart work of... of really looking deep within and asking God to reveal these things. So, of course, there's, there's those incredible spiritual benefits that come from that. But, you know, also, there are a few things more off-putting and dangerous than someone who does not examine themselves. 
someone who has no introspection, someone who has no self-awareness. Um, you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, maybe, maybe that's you. I mean, and we can all be in that place sometimes, right? But, but uh, you know, for someone who, who just kind of just assumes the best of themselves, never really looks deep within, you know, if, if there's ever a dispute, it's always the other person's fault, that kind of, kind of person, right? We, we all need that humility. We all need that self-awareness. We all need that introspection to look in and say, wait a second. Yeah, my way seemed pure to me, but... The Lord weighs the motives. And guess what? I, I recognize that even, even though things might seem pure to me, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I probably got all kinds of um, impure motives mixed in here. Right? Just to have that kind of humility makes you a better person. Just on a practical note. But it's, it's essential for us to become more and more like Jesus. Right? A person is not going to grow in their sanctification. They're not going to grow in their holiness. They're not going to grow in their Christ-likeness if they, they never look deep within, if, if they're not willing to see those dark places, right? And it's, it's understandable. We don't want to see them, right? But we, 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 can't just, we can't just be blind to it. So as we come to a close, I'll kind of come full circle back to this phrase, follow your heart. Again, my caution is to not do this, or certainly not to do it blindly. But rather, we must guard our hearts, and we must examine our hearts. And perhaps the biggest reason for this is that at the end of the day, our heart is going to hold some sway. At the end of the day, we are going to follow our hearts to some extent, whether we do that intentionally or not. And so, we, we must guard our hearts. We must keep them from corruption as much as we can. And we must be aware of those secret places of our hearts that still need a lot of work, which requires us to examine our hearts. We must guard and examine our hearts. And then ultimately, we must surrender our hearts to the Lord. And so, we'll close with this question. Have you done that? Have you surrendered your heart to the Lord? Are you doing that? As you guard your heart, as you examine your heart, are you saying, hey, this is a mess. Lord, I, I, I give it to you. I surrender to you. We must do that because not only will it determine the destiny of, it, it will only determine the destiny of your soul, but it will also determine how you live today, whether or not you surrender to the Lord. Let me read you this quote by Tim Keller. It says, What your heart most loves and trusts, the mind finds reasonable, the emotions find desirable, and the will finds doable. I'm going to read that one or two more times here in a second, but let, 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 me, just, let me just break it down, right? Basically, what he's saying here is what I said just a moment ago, that really, like, we're going to follow our hearts, at least to some extent, whether we intend to or not. The heart is a powerful, powerful thing. That's why we must guard it. That's why we must examine it. We don't want to follow it blindly, but the fact is, what your heart most loves, the mind finds reasonable. All right, do you get that? Right? We, we, we might think that we have full control of our hearts through our minds, but no, the emotions, the affections, it's a powerful thing. And that's why God demands our heart, not just our mind, but wants our heart. Right? Because if our affections are somewhere else, then you know, we can affirm all kinds of facts about the Lord and all that, but you know, ultimately, our heart's going to make things seem reasonable that maybe aren't so reasonable, right? What your heart most loves and trusts, the mind finds reasonable. The emotions find desirable, right? Whatever your heart loves and trusts, your emotions will find desirable. And then finally, the will finds doable. Right? If your heart's in it, then your will is going to find it doable. But if your heart's not in it, then you may say, oh yeah, I want to do this, but you're not going to do it, right? 
And so, so, so there's almost a little bit of a paradox here. On one hand, we're saying, okay, be careful. You don't want to follow your heart, certainly not blindly. But then the fact is, well, yeah, we're all going to follow our heart, at least to some extent. And that is precisely the reason why we must guard it and why we must examine it. And then finally, most importantly, we must surrender it to the Lord. So guard your heart, examine your heart, continually surrender it to the Lord, and then you'll be on the right path. Let's pray. God, we um, are thankful for the wisdom of your word. I pray that these Proverbs and other passages that we've read this morning, that they will be anchored deep within our hearts. Help us to know our hearts in such a way that we know our need for a Savior and that we surrender ourselves fully to you. We thank you for Jesus, that in Christ we have a love and forgiveness that is even greater than our sin. And so help us to embrace that. Help us to be changed by it. We pray this in Jesus' name.